Amen. And amen. There is power in the name of Jesus. Come on and just thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for the power that is in his name. God bless you people of the way. It is indeed a blessing to be back one more time, one more Sunday uh, to celebrate the goodness of the Lord on this Eucharistic Sunday. We are gathered uh, on this, the first Sunday in June. And there's so much uh, that is coming to us. Our anniversary celebration month will be next month. And so uh, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, we're going to have a special state of the church meeting on Wednesday. Uh, and we're inviting all of you to come. We're going to give you some updates about our plans uh, for reentry. We're going to give you some updates about our plans for anniversary, some updates about our, our uh, financial situations and our ministry updates. We have all kinds of good things. And so uh, literally, we are moving into our 16th year of ministry here at the Way Church uh, and are, are so excited uh, for the ways in which God has blessed us. Uh, and so we want to acknowledge uh, where God has brought us, but also begin to lift up our eyes into the future of where we know God would have us to go. And that now brings us then to our time of preaching. You know, every year I, I am always so uh, honored and, and thankful to be able to look forward to Pentecost Sunday. And it fell a little earlier this year. And so Pastor Tanisha with her Pentecostal self, somebody say amen, uh, has been holding it down and has indeed given us some amazing preaching and teaching on the impact of not just Pentecost and Easter and resurrection. What does it mean for us to be living in light of these realities? Uh, but I feel compelled to, to, to also just open up this concept and this idea of why Pentecost is so necessary. Why are we a people, a church, even with all the many expressions of Christian faith uh, abounding? Why is it so important for the way to hold on to, to reclaim, to reimagine, to lean into, to live out a faith grounded in Pentecostal sensibilities. Well, uh, it is indeed, I think, a, a great gift to the church, uh, the Pentecostal uh, expression of Christian faith, the spirituality of Pentecostalism that has found its way now in every nook and cranny of God's church across the world. And uh, we're going to use a seminal text here uh, out of the book of Joel, chapter number two, to help uh, bring home what I hope will be a message that begins to launch us into our season of consecration, our celebration of anniversary, and all the other meaningful things that happen during the month of June that remind us of not just our difference, but our unity through difference. And that is indeed uh, the great gift of Pentecost, that the Spirit brings us together uh, across that which the world would seek to divide us. And uh, this, I believe, is the power of God's Spirit. So we're going to take a, 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 a trot over into Joel, the second chapter. Uh, this is one of my most favorite passages of Scripture. It is a, 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 a compass, if you will, for uh, the way's mission and vision and expression and and description it 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 it, it is a filter it is uh, uh one of those uh glasses you put on when you go into a 3D movie to try and make sure that you're seeing everything you want and need to see uh this is one of these passages that has been instructive and important for our ministry vision and so uh, as we lean into this season let's take a look at Gen at Joel chapter number two. The book of Joel, obviously, uh, to some, maybe not to all, is uh, a very important part of the prophets, the prophetic text of the Jewish uh, scriptures. We call them the Old Testament, if you will. But it reminds us that God always has spokespeople, folks that God seeks to anoint for a particular task. And God will speak a message through one person or many people for the masses. 
And Joel is thought to have been spoken to a people coming out of exile. Some put it in the 9th century BCE. Others put it in the 5th century. So that'd be around 400 or so, 460, if you will, uh, before the Christian era. But Joel is a text of prophetic and apocalyptic uh, meaning and purpose. And, and, and if uh, you are like me, uh, believing we are wading through apocalyptic times, Lord, have mercy. Then I thank God for the prophets that help us make sense uh, and perhaps catalyze us to speak into these moments with a vision for a future yet to be determined. Joel chapter number two, uh, we're going to go to uh, verse number 28 and the words of Joel, uh, then afterward I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Some of you are familiar with uh, us using this passage many times. Everybody say all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And even on the male and female slaves or servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and I will show portents in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes." Uh, if I could just park real quick right there, because, you know, it's very interesting. You've got to imagine that this prophet is likely responding or describing what he was seeing by revelation of God's interaction with him. Uh, there are all these recordings in the, the ancient texts and civilizations of individuals having visions, um, having uh, these, these revelatory experiences that when they put pen to paper, they described what they saw or the sentiments of what was being revealed to them for the purposes of the audience to capture the, the magnitude of what they were experiencing. And if I were to take a look at uh, verses 30 and 31 that we just read, I would say this prophet is trying to describe a catastrophic environment that in many ways the prophet is being shown by God that in the last day when the spirit is poured out, there will be a context of catastrophe. There will be an environment of upheaval, blood, fire, columns of smoke, war, death, uh, destruction. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Ecological disasters. That in many ways, the prophet is trying to communicate to the people that in the last day, the day when uh, the earth and creation begins to reach a tipping point, God says in the midst of all of that trouble, that is an opportune time for you, child of God, to get your cups open and ready. Why? Because I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. Lord, have mercy. Verse 32. Then everyone, somebody say everyone, who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape. Listen, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Lord, have mercy. The word of God for us, the reading of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Amen. Uh, I'm going to speak from the topic for a few moments. Why we need Pentecost. Indeed, why we need Pentecost. Come on, put it in the chat, somebody. I need a Pentecost. Say that. I need a Pentecost. Uh, somebody, you know, may want to say it differently. Folk ask you, why are you carrying on like that? Tell them, blame it on the Holy Ghost. Uh, the Holy Spirit made me do it. Amen. The way I live, the way I carry myself, when it is a result of God's Spirit, the Pentecost, the moment of radical transformation, I can't take no credit for it. You got to blame it on the Holy Ghost. Now, June is a consequential month for so many of us in our congregation, in our community, dare I say. 
uh, across this country. Uh, it has become the month of, of celebration and honoring of the contributions of our LGBTQ loved ones, a month that is called Pride Month. And obviously when we were growing up, for many, this month was not something we would dare speak in the church. Oh, but somebody, amen, just ought to say uh, that uh, we have continued to progress and appreciate that our queer loved ones are not only here to stay, but they've always been welcomed at the table of God. We also know June is a consequential month for fathers and mentors as we celebrate Father's Day in a few weeks. Uh, Juneteenth, a holiday of consequence for black folks in this country uh, who are the descendants of uh, enslaved Africans, being reminded of the historical moment when we were declared free from slavery in a town down in Texas. Uh, and certainly as a congregation, we uh, celebrate now uh, the season of our anniversary uh, with a penultimate consecration where we spend time before the Lord uh, fasting and praying and committing to more service and reflection as we go into a new year. So our faithfulness to God can always be grounded in the disciplines of our faith. Oh, yes, this is a moment and a time where uh, we are entering into the month of June. And uh, this month historically kind of uh, couches the day of Pentecost, the Pentecostal calendar, if you will, in the liturgical calendar, the day of Pentecost, a moment where we celebrate the birth of the church as declared in Scripture in the book of Acts. But there's also, for us who are uh, part of the, the Pentecostal uh, revivals of the 20th century, we also acknowledge that there is something significant about the Pentecostal movement of the 20th century. And I thought it'd be important for me just to give you a little bit of a, of a reflection on this because we do say that we are a church that is birthed and emerging from the soil of black holiness Pentecostal movements. And it's important for us to uh, situate ourselves in this context. I, I, I was at the homegoing celebration of uh, the supervisor evangelist chair lady Joyce Rogers of the Church of God in Christ, a dear mentor and a, a friend to me and uh, our, our ministry and the work that we've been doing. And as I sat in Bishop T.D. Jake's church in Dallas, Texas, where the homegoing celebration was happening, I began to not only experience nostalgia, but a deep appreciation of what does it mean to live in a world characterized by death and yet be living in the spirit in spite of that contrasted reality. Uh, that Pentecost, in many respects, is a countercultural, counterworldly sensibility that uh, the movement of Pentecost around the turn of the 20th century was thought to have been God's last great outpouring of God's spirit before the apocalyptic ending of the world. That was the sentiment of so many during that time, they were praying and fasting. They were uh, coming into a new century, and there were all these cultural upheavals in the latter uh, years of the, the 1800s and coming into the 1900s. Revivals and, 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 and meetings were breaking out all across the world, and you had many different mainline Christian traditions from the Catholics to the Anglicans or the Episcopals to the Baptists to the Methodists. To this. Everyone was having this interesting angst but expectation. And as history would teach us, uh, there became a, a, a little uh, gathering of ragtag believers, if you will. Black and white uh, believers in Los Angeles, in a small town in, in the L.A. region called Azusa. And they began to have a prayer revival. And it's not clear exactly what, what mainline denominations these Christians were from, but they decided to meet 
and pray and, and, and sing songs together during a Jim Crow racially segregated era where blacks and whites would not be allowed to congregate in the same space by law. They were drawn together by the Spirit. And then you heard uh, miracles and tongue talking and music and uh, all kinds of expressions began to emerge and the word got out and folks would travel from all across the world to this small building, a little old, little old storefront church, kind of the size of ours. And, and, and it got so large that people would come uh, and the revival lasted for hundreds of days. People would work in the morning. And, and, and all day, and they would go home, clean themselves up, and come to the Azusa Street Revival and have church and prayer meetings all night long, go take a quick nap, go home, get dressed, and they would come back and work. And it became so popular that it was on the front of the Los Angeles newspapers, and the literal headline would say that the color line has been washed away in the blood. The color line has been washed away by the blood of Jesus. And it became a very important seminal moment in the life of the global church that in a season where difference and division was literally carving up God's creation all over the world. God decided once again to show up among the poor and the disenfranchised, an interracial group of individuals who were seeking God's faith with such fervor that God literally poured out God's spirit in that place. And all of these folks that uh, would come and visit these spaces would go back into their homes. And Bishop Charles Mason was one of such leaders. And he was a Baptist holiness preacher. He was not someone who spoke in tongues necessarily uh, when he came to Azusa, was not someone who was necessarily convinced about the Holy Spirit's uh, kind of functionality in their, their world per se, beyond uh, a basic uh, sinner's prayer, if you will. Uh, they believed that to be saved or to be filled with the Holy Spirit meant that you would just live a holy life. And there were scriptures that said, we follow peace with everyone and holiness. Somebody say peace and holiness. Amen. Uh, without which no one can see the Lord. And Bishop Mason came and had his experience, went back and launched the church of God in Christ that has become one of the largest Christian Pentecostal denominations in the world. He was known for his anti-war stances, which led to an investigation by the FBI. And he was set up to be charged with sedition and treason because him and his early uh, adherents of the Church of God in Christ were pacifists and conscientious objectors uh, to world wars and they would not fight in the military. You had G.T. Haywood. He was a Methodist holiness preacher. So that meant that he was not Baptist. He came out of the Methodist church, uh, which was a carryover of the Wesleyan holiness movement out of uh, the England context. And he was someone known for ordaining women. And he was in the Midwest, uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana. And so you had a Southern and a Midwestern expression of Pentecostal faith. And you had all these different expressions popping up all over the world. And it's so important, I think, to know this context. Why? Because things I love to celebrate about the Pentecostal tradition of the 20th century that I think are relevant for where we are going today is that these uh, traditions produced uh, a whole new movement of Christ followers who were leaders of churches and denominations and, and, and re kind of writing what it meant to follow Jesus faithfully in some of the mainline denominations. More women were ordained in Pentecostal movements of the 20th century than all of the movements combined, it would appear, during that time. Not since the days of the prophets like Joel would one argue that the poor had catalyzed such a movement. And, and, and it would spread throughout the world to the point where now Pentecostalism, hip-hop, and Islam are regarded by uh, anthropologists as the three most influential global movements to this day. 
Pentecost then would become a biblical and theological framework that would become enfleshed through the experiences of the most vulnerable, resulting in a radically reimagined and reconstituted creation. I'll say that again because I want you to catch the, 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 the words that I am attempting uh, to describe why we still need Pentecost. It becomes a both biblical, which means it is found in Scripture, and a theological, the way we interpret Scripture and conversations about God's activity in the world, biblical and theological framework, that which helps us to have an ordered description of what faithfulness looks like in flesh through the experiences, meaning that we all have experiences of God. Pentecost became both a biblical and theological framework in flesh through the experiences of the most vulnerable among us. That resulted in a radically reimagined and reconstituted creation. If the Genesis narrative is the first biblical record of creation, Acts Pentecost is the second creative narrative that informs the Christian tradition. Why? Because the outpouring of the Spirit of God being actively done on all flesh is the great equalizer. It is the, the act that makes all things new with possibility and opportunity. When you look at the word all flesh in the, the biblical text, the Hebrew word there is basar, and it means flesh. Anyone, bodies, body, flesh, man, mankind, man, humanity, men, women, person, all of these words are meant to help describe what all flesh is intending to discuss. And one of our greatest challenges when we read Scripture is that too many of us, we are uh, taught to read Scripture with such rigidity and not imagination that we apply our Western notions of fundamentalism that are informed by Eurocentric rigidity in ways that rob us of the divine possibility of what Pentecost brings to us. And I want you to know, even in the early years of the Pentecostal movement, there were so-called Christians like uh, uh, Charles Parham who would come into the L.A. Azusa revival and see black and white uh, Christians uh, weeping in one another's arms, slayed out on the ground, speaking in tongues together. And because his mind was too small, he called it a, a den of demons and hellish behavior because he could not ascertain what the spirit was up to. I want you to know, child of God, that many of us feel dissonance because what we see or perceive is grounded in a fundamentalism that robs us of the potential of Pentecost. And we see the rigidity in how we read the text as well. I I'll never forget when I was uh, talking and, and discursing with a Jewish scholar a few years ago, uh, and, and she cautioned me on reading the text with Western rigidity, with Western uh, fundamentalistic uh, 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 mindsets. And there was a great article to this point that talked about how uh, because the Christian tradition, dare I say the Jewish tradition, emerges out of an Eastern African context. Uh, it is wonder, and it is amazement, and it is relationality that should inform the text rather than fundamentalism and control and individuality. Ooh, I, my mind is still trying to fully comprehend all of this. But what it did uh, teach me is that if Western interpretation of Scripture emerges from fundamentalism, historical readings of the text are much more comfortable in contested and relational conversations. And she went on to give the example about the rigidity of binary reading of text versus what is an interesting tool 
called merisms or the moristic readings of text. Uh, for example, when God says in Genesis that uh, he created heaven and earth, uh, a Western reading of the text that applied fundamentalism across the board would have to conclude that God did not create anything in between the spectrum of heaven and earth. A fundamentalist reading would have to conclude that God did not create anything except for light and dark. That God did not create anything except for the binary of night and day and even male and female and even the affirmament above and the firmament beneath. That in many respects, when we read scripture with rigidity, we leave out the opportunity for wonder and nuance. And our experience of the in-between child of God is where we see the most powerful expressions of Pentecost. Why? Because in the in-between moments, uh-huh, in the in-between moments of our lives that are lived, uh, it is our experience that gets to be in a discursive conversation with the Spirit of God and, and, and the revelation of God and the, the reason and intellect that we have been gifted with uh, help us to come to conclusions uh, that help create uh, harmony where there's dissonance. And I want you to know, child of God, that in this very complex and nuanced context where we are living, we must be people who are able and willing to live in the in-between. As a Pentecostal person, as someone who wants to embrace wonder and not fundamentalism, as someone who wants to replace fluidity and, uh, and not uh, rigidity, as someone who wants to move beyond binaries and understand the spectrum of merism as an interpretive tool, you and I must allow our experiences to help shine a light on the defense of the gospel with faithfulness, courage, and boldness. Boldness. And I want you to know this is where I find the 20th century uh, Pentecostal framework to be so important because it is this framework that continues to inform what it means to be faithful. Uh, yeah, now I, I got I to gotta bring in a, a, a Bishop Lawson. He is the, the founder of our denomination that ordained me and brought me up. Amen. And this is what I love about Bishop Lawson. 1918 or 17 or 19, I don't remember, he wrote a great a book called uh, 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 The Anthropology of Jesus Christ, Our Kinsman. And in his book, this is what he said literally in the 19s, uh -huh, uh, literally in the uh, aftermath or the season of the Spanish flu a time not too different from the coronavirus. You had the rise of Pentecostal preachers and pastors of, of prophetesses, of, of folk who were evangelists, men and women, uh, uh, rich and poor, uh, folk who, who some deemed to be uh, learned and those who believed to be unlearned, all kind of coalescing into a new expression of faith and, 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 and relationship to Christ and creation. Bishop Lawson says it like this, Pentecostal people could teach mainline churches a wonderful lesson by example in showing that the true people of God are one regardless of what nationality or race they may belong. By abiding together in the bonds of fellowship, love, and organization. He goes on to say, we trusted that the Pentecostal people would rise to redeem man by example and precept. It is all right to sing and shout and pray and preach loud. Listen to this. But what this poor world is longing for is the real love of God lived. And I want you to know, child of God, that this is what it means for you and I to be Pentecostal, that we are fusing, Lord have mercy, uh, scripture and tradition and our experiences and our practices uh, fused through and through by a radical outpouring of God's spirit. 
That as the scripture says, uh, when you receive the spirit, you will speak with new tongues. Uh, That you will see dreams and visions. That even when you get bit by snakes, uh, that no thing will harm you, child of God. That to be Pentecostal means that you have access to the power of the living God. Listen, so you can live out the real love of God. And this is what you and I must make our goal because the prophet Joel was obviously uh, having some visions uh, about the context of his day. And he was understanding that with catastrophe all around, with ecological disasters manifesting themselves, with us coming out of bondage or wrestling with what it means to be free in a world characterized by oppression. Joel is proclaiming that in the last day, God will pour out God's spirit on all flesh. And I want you to know that's the first thing that you and I must do if we are going to be Pentecostal. Uh, we must make room for all flesh yeah come on just put that in the chat and just say come on scoot over i need to make some room for all flesh yes all flesh now again if you take the scripture seriously and i do (laughs) praise god that when the scripture says that it will be poured out on all flesh yo sons and daughters shall prophesy the scripture is speaking to gender differences When it says that your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams, it's speaking to the ageism and intergenerational nature of division so often in our world. When the scripture says that on my 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 maid servants and my servants will I pour out, my spirit is talking about the class differences, the status and the social locations. That literally the prophet through his apocalyptic vision is calling you and I into a space where we can make room for all flesh. And how many of you know that sometimes the hardest thing to do is to make room for those who you don't feel not only fit in, but it's difficult to make room when your mindset is grounded in a scarcity framework. Ooh, Lord, have mercy. Come on, you, you, you ought to just put it in the chat and, and, and just say, I got to shed my scarcity framework. How many of you know there's always room for all flesh? That scarcity does not jive with Pentecost. <laughs> Lord, help me to preach in here today. Uh, that, that God always creates more than enough room for everybody God calls. And this is the most important qualifier. God calls everyone. Come on here, somebody. Come on, put it in the chat just to remind yourself. God calls everyone. And the question you got to ask yourself is, if God is calling everyone, why are you upset when everyone answers the call? Oh, uh, Brother Mike, I feel like preaching up in here, Doc. You stay over there in that booth and get me right. Amen. Now, why is it that if God calls everyone, not you, not me, amen, because I don't have no telephone to ring you up on, praise God. Uh, not the kind of call that God makes on your soul, amen, and not the kind of call that God makes in your spirit and in your mind. Uh, can you remember when God called you uh, and how different it was than when your boo called you or when your partner called you or when the preacher called you I heard a sound that nobody could replicate uh, and I had to say yes Lord Uh, yes Lord from the bottom of my heart Woo! to the depths of my soul I had to say yes don't you know God knows how to call some of you in a way where you can't 
possibly say no. And I want you to know that it is that calling that God is trying to get some of us to answer. And if God calls you, oh, child of God, I got to make room for you. Now, the reality historically and even in this contemporary moment is that we are not good at making room for people different from us. Uh, this is how Bishop Yvette Flunder, one of our most important voices on inclusion in the body of Christ, right here in Oakland, she says it like this, that the tortured historical and theological view that suggests that some people by nature are just flawed has been the convenient method used to hold women, immigrants, the poor, and LGBT people in chains of self-depreciation. Uh, we all, everybody say all, there goes that all word again. We all need community. And I want you to know in a month where we celebrate pride, amen, in a time where we are trying to live up to the call to make sure our undocumented loved ones, those who have been caught in the, the, the drug wars of yesteryear, uh, those who have been criminalized and uh, still locked up in jail while coronavirus is happening, uh, those who find themselves unhoused because of the greed of the market uh, and the speculators who have snatched housing out of the hands of the poor and only left them to be uh, literally sleeping on the streets in the most wealthiest region in the country. Uh, I want you to know God is trying to call somebody and ask them, can you make room? for all flesh. Uh, can you make room in your theology and in your ecclesiology and in your life and in your home and your politics? Can you make room uh, to care for those who may be different from you? Uh, uh, to be Pentecostal means to expand uh, the context of what the scripture says in Hebrews to follow peace with everybody. Meaning what does it mean to be a peacemaker. What does it mean to seek peace in an unjust world, in a violent world, and holiness? What does it mean to seek right behavior, to treat the poor and the dispossessed, and those who are living on the margins in a way that brings life back to them? What does it mean to acknowledge that anti-blackness and transphobia literally result in the death of God's creation? What does it mean uh, to be able to declare uh, that voter suppression restricts the access to the ballot box for too many black Americans? Uh, what does it mean to acknowledge that continued violence uh, in Palestine, Israel, uh, in parts of Africa, in parts of Central America, uh, that it requires us to have a sense of belonging? Uh, what does it mean for you and I to acknowledge that our theology allows us to be comfortable with undocumented loved ones uh, still languishing at the border. Uh, even under a democratic president. What does it mean uh, to acknowledge that even all of us who are turned out and up about justice still harbor anti-Semitism and anti-Asian sentiments? Uh, I want you to know that all of us need to remember that the spirit Pentecost has room for all flesh to thrive both in the spirit and in the body. And so my question to you, is your circle of belonging and concern large enough? Oh, this is a question for you and I. This is a question we must reckon with. This is a question for the Pentecostal uh, uh, saints among us. Amen. Is our circle of belonging large enough? How is the spirit calling us into faithful relationships with all flesh? The folk you think you don't like that don't belong, are you courageous enough to be in a relationship 
with our LGBTQ loved ones, with justice impacted, that means people with criminal records and convictions, with Pookie and Ray Ray and Jose and Maria hanging outside on the corner, with our undocumented loved ones, with our unhoused loved ones. What does it mean, child of God, to say, I need a Pentecost so I can be in relationship? with all flesh, not just the ones I like. <laughs> Lord, let me keep moving here. I, I got at least two more points to go. That, that Pentecost then calls you and I to live, to love, and to speak boldly. <laughs> Come on, put it in the chat. Say, oh, I got to live like Pentecost. I got to love like Pentecost. I got to speak like Pentecost. It means that I can't be a, a, a coward when it comes to these matters. That I'm going to have to learn to cultivate courage in the face of the status quo. I love being at the service of, of, of Joyce Rogers uh, uh, who uh, was, was preaching in a context where hierarchy had obviously remained institutionalized by gender. And that she she, although she knew she was called to preach, uh, she knew that she had to navigate uh, through some tumultuous waters to fulfill her call. Uh, and I'm here to tell you, child of God, uh, that you and I cannot allow uh, the exclusion uh, that is placed in, in our path by others uh, to keep us from living out our faithful bold call to love. You may have to be fluid, praise God. You may have to be flexible. You may have to be chameleon-like. You may have to, you know, uh, swallow some things that you don't like from time to time. But I'm here to tell you that when you are faithful to God's call, even the walls that they erect, God will either give you the strength to run through those walls or to leap over them. Lord, I feel like running and leaping all at the same time. You ought to just pat yourself on the chest while you're at home and say, God, give me Pentecostal power to leap over walls, to run through walls, or dare I say, to take some time to cut through the walls with a door so others can come behind me. Yeah, 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 yeah. God is calling you and I to live and to love and to speak boldly. Speak out right now with an imagination that sees those things that are not as though they are. Ask God to give you a voice like God gave to the folk in the day of Pentecost where they spoke in other tongues. Why? Because they were speaking to folk who needed to hear the good news of the gospel in a word that in a language they could understand it talk in a way yeah, that helps folks to know that the good news is not relegated to those who only understand English or maleness or wealth or power or denomination but God has given me a tongue a language both for my my devotional and personal uh, building, uh, but also for my social uh, and my communal and creation uh, redemptive uh, work. Uh, I want you to know God has given you a tongue, uh, a special language, uh, a special ability. And I got to let you know uh -huh, that on the day of Pentecost in Acts, uh, when they heard people speaking in their language, uh, knowing they had never been uh, to their native country, uh, they became convinced uh, that if God can speak so mightily to me uh, in a language you don't know, uh, then surely God can speak directly to me uh, in the language that God surely knows. Uh, it means Means that God brings down the divisions uh, so we all can sit at the table of fellowship uh, live and love and speak boldly uh, and child of God my question to you today is what circumstances in your life uh, require a bold witness of God's love and truth 
truth. How can you practice being bold this week? On your job, in your family, on your block. In a couple of weeks, we about to put out a call to all these churches out here who are being seduced by the call for more cops in the midst of all of this violence in our communities. Yeah, we got a problem with gun violence. Yeah, Pookie and Ray Ray and Keisha and Jose Maria, all the young folk and some older folk out here overtaken with rage and anger and frustration and anxiety and pain and mental illness. And they're revolting to destructive behavior. But some folk uh, don't have a Pentecostal mindset. Uh, they don't have a sense of history. Uh, they don't have experiences uh, that remind them uh, uh, that back in 1994 when uh, our current president, then Senator Biden, uh, championed the crime bill, uh, it was in the same context. Uh, crime was up. Shootings were up. Folk were wilding out everywhere. Uh, we asked for jobs. We asked for healing. We asked for cops, uh, and what they gave us were no jobs, uh, no healing, uh, a lot of cops, which then resulted in jails. Uh, we will not make that mistake again. Uh, we need a thousand churches uh, to come on this summer, and let's make peace in the neighborhood. Let's make peace on the block. Uh, let's sponsor some barbecues. Let's hug some loved ones. Uh, let's get some men and women and loved ones, uh, gender non-conforming folk. Let's get some people out here to put your arms around some of our hurting, uh, frustrated, violent young people and old folk. Uh, and let's love them uh, into peace. Love them uh, into hope. Love them uh, out of death. Uh, that is what it means to be Pentecostal. Uh, that I won't ask the devil to do the work that only the saints can do. Uh, you got to have the power of God uh, to be able to bring those folk uh, who are destructive into constructive life. Uh, and this is what we're called to do, child of God. Uh, we're called to bring life uh, mm, out of death-filled uh, situations. Uh, oh, my last thing uh, that I want to say uh, is that you and I then as people who are filled with Pentecost must see what we can't see. Yeah. Somebody holler it out, oh, I got to see yeah. what I can't see. I got to see visions. I got to dream dreams. I got to see what I can't see. One of our themes for this year is that we are reimagining. We are reclaiming. We are restoring. We are reconstituting a society that has been literally obliterated by coronavirus. We got mass misinformation. People out here denying that 500,000 souls and bodies uh, were, were, were killed during this coronavirus. Uh, folk targeting black folk and, and, and brown folk, uh, uh, white folk who are Trump supporters uh, with misinformation uh, causing you to suspect and be suspicious uh, of a vaccine or other practices uh, that literally can cause our lives uh, to be be less at risk. You got folk out here. I read an article, 12 bloggers uh, are, res are, are responsible for over 60 to 70 percent uh, of the misinformation targeting our communities uh, around COVID-19, around the mitigation efforts, around vaccinations. Uh, folk out here targeting you, uh, targeting our family. Uh, I was told Piedmont got 90 percent of their folk vaccinated. Uh, 98 percent of folk in Piedmont already has the first shot. But when you come into Oakland where all of us live, less than 20% of us have even received uh, the, 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 the shot of a vaccine that could literally take the bite out of this deadly pandemic. What am I trying to say? Some of us need to ask God, give me a vision and give me a dream that can help me construct a new reality that if I never take the vaccine, God, how can I build a society that helps me be able to take care of those who are the most vulnerable? If I never 
I get my business back? How can I see what I can't see and love beyond the boundaries and the binaries and the tribalisms that cause you and I to break from one another? How can I forgive? Lord, have mercy beyond my capacity. How can I continue to ask for the healing of my own self, but also lift up my eyes to the healing that others need? I want you to know, child of God, that just like the scripture says in verse 31, that there will be those who escape, which lets me know that not everybody's going to make it out, unfortunately, but we who escape. Somebody holler, we who escape. The scripture says that the Lord will call among the survivors those who should be called. Oh, I want you to know if you can just survive, God says you will be one of the called. God calls survivors. You ought to pat yourself on the chest like you in the audition for uh, the redo of uh, the Destiny Child video. Uh, but you ought to holler, I am a survivor. Uh, I'm not going to give up. Uh, why? Because God calls uh, survivors. Uh, I just got to keep pushing through. Uh, I know that I may want to throw in the towel, uh, but I will survive. Uh, I know that I may feel like giving up, uh, but I I will survive. I know you may feel like uh, this situation is too heavy, uh, but child of God on Pentecost Sunday, uh, you will survive. And if you can survive, uh, and if you can escape, uh, among the survivors uh, shall be those who the Lord calls. Uh, you are being called. Uh, we are being called uh, as survivors uh, who have escaped uh, the wicked plans uh, of the enemy. Uh, and I want you to know, child of God, uh, that this is the moment uh, that we got to declare, Lord, help me uh, to have a Pentecostal mindset. Uh, I'm not just talking about the having good church, uh, although I like to do that from time to time. I'm not just talking uh, about having uh, uh, a nice uh, praise and worship service, uh, although I like to do that from time to time. I'm not just talking about being someone who can uh, speak with new tongues uh, and dream dreams and see visions. Uh, but I'm talking about me being someone uh, who walks around with my cup uh, open for God to fill me up. Uh, fill me up till I overflow. Uh, I want to run over. Uh, I want to run over. Uh, this is is Pentecost. Uh, it is the opportunity uh, for us across our differences uh, to be bottom lined uh, by the power of the Spirit. Uh, and I'm so glad today uh, to know that the Spirit uh, always makes room uh, for all flesh. Uh, I'm glad to know uh, that the Spirit always helps me to live and to love and to speak boldly. Uh, I'm always glad to know that the Spirit helps me to see what I can't see. And if you want to make room, and if you want to speak boldly, and love boldly, and live boldly, and if you want to see what you can't see, this is why we need Pentecost. Somebody come on and clap your hands right in your house and holler, I need Pentecost. We need Pentecost. Even right now. Even in this season. Even in this moment. We need Pentecost. And child of God, as long as the way is here, we will be a church that is seeking Pentecost, not a denomination, 
not a singular experience, but a radical reconstitution of all flesh where sons and daughters shall prophesy, where old men shall dream dreams and young men shall see visions, where the handmaidens and the servants will be eligible for the spirit of the Lord. We will seek Pentecost where everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, child of God, do you want Pentecost? Do you want Pentecost in your family? Do you want Pentecost in your community? Do you want salvation to overflow from your cup onto your block and into your house and into your neighborhood and into this country and the world? And this is our prayer. Lord, send your spirit down. Let it fall afresh upon us. God, help us to make decisions and choices that are clear that we have decided to follow you. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though the world forsake me, still. I will follow. I've decided to make you my choice. And some of you today have not yet decided. Jesus, have not yet opened your cup up for Pentecost. I want you to know this is a good time and a good day to make a decision in your heart with your will. God, I decide today to follow the ways of Jesus. Come on. The way of Jesus is a path that leads us through suffering, but ultimate victory. So child of God, even right now, make a decision. God, I pray for every person right now who has not yet decided to follow you. God, we want to follow you. We want to be saved from our sins. We want to be right. We want to have holiness and peace be the characteristics that constantly describe us. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It just means that we're set apart. That you have special purposes that qualify us for special uses. This is God our prayer. God, call us. Help us to answer the phone when you call. And help us to say yes, yes, yes.